this morning, if you would, please turn with me to uh, Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter number 10. Gospel of Mark, chapter number 10. And as you find it, we're looking for verse, verse number 46. Mark chapter 10, verse number 46. Very, very familiar passage, which has a corresponding passage in Matthew chapter 20, but we'll not be uh, returning there. Uh, the sort of not turning there this morning, we'll be staying in Mark's account uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ coming through uh, Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> looking at this man blind, Bartimaeus. Now, as we read through these verses, uh, together this morning from verse 46 down through to the end of the chapter. Of course, we have a historical account, a historical narrative of the Lord Jesus Christ actually meeting with an actual person who was actually blind. So we have a historical account. What we also have is a spiritual picture that I've preached on uh, before, it's a wonderful spiritual picture of what happens when the blind get sight, i.e. the unsaved become saved. So there's a great spiritual type in there with that, and we've preached in, in, on that uh, before. I also believe there's another spiritual type that uh, the Lord showed me there this morning, and um, it's with that thought I'd like to look at these verses this morning. So if I tell you what the title is before we read the verses, the Lord may be able to start uh, leading and guiding you in the thought this morning. So the title is The Power of Specific Prayer. The Power of Specific Prayer. That's the title. That's the thought. That's how I'd like you to come to these verses as we go through them this morning. As I uh, take a spiritual leap, but I don't think it does violence to the text. I don't believe it does at all. Uh, I appreciate it's not exegetic, exegetical historically, but I believe there's a real spiritual truth in there about the power of specific prayer. So if you have your Bible open, Mark chapter 10, verse number 46. Just a quick glance at the clock. I was making sure it was working this morning. Or safe. It's been put right. You'll be, you'll be okay. If you weren't here for all, you didn't get the live stream, you won't understand that reference. All right, from the Word of God, Mark chapter 10, verse number 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, so this is Christ, the disciples, and the crowd that were following him. And a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more, a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. What a joy it is to read such a passage of Scripture. What a blessing it is to read such a passage of Scripture as Bible-believing Christians, knowing this is not an allegory, this is not a parable, this is not a myth, this is not a legend, this is a real account of a real miracle in the life of a real person, disabled by blindness, as he met the real Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we can't approach this in a sterile fashion as words on a page. This was an amazing, incredible, life-changing event, a life-shaping event. Can you even imagine what it must have been like to be Bartimaeus? We're thankful that in uh, the world that we live in today, blindness is a lot less common. And thank the Lord for that. You know, it, it is a tough disability to have, and we're so very, very thankful. You know, the, do you understand that many people 
claim or make the claim against us as Bible-believing Christians that we're anti-science. Nothing, friend, could be further from the truth. The Bible is not anti-science. Bible-believing Christians are not anti-science. We're opposed to science, falsely so-called, science that isn't actually science. People say, give me an example. How about the last 18 months? There's a good one. That'll do for a start. But we won't go there this morning. But, you know, I was so thankful that through true advances, and true advances are given by God in his common grace. Did you know that? You know, you don't just sit there one day philosophizing and musing and suddenly think, I wonder if there's electricity flowing through the air that I can't see. God puts those things into people's mind for the common good and the common benefit from the common grace of God. And through great scientific advances, of course, many blindnesses, some of them inherited, some of them physiological conditions, are able to be removed by changes in diet and living and hygiene and general living conditions. Many are now able to be changed, corrected and reversed as a result of surgical advances. And for all that, we praise the Lord, not man, because God has given that. Now, the fact as to whether, you know, specialist surgeons and scientists acknowledge that God has allowed or given that doesn't change the fact that he has. And therefore, God is not anti-science. The Bible is not anti-science. Bible-believing Christians are not anti-science, and we celebrate every event that helps people, and, and particularly from a condition that would be discomforting, uh, uh, difficult, and would make life very hard, uh, such as that which Bartimaeus would find himself in, particularly in the ancient world when all opportunities would be removed. I mean, we, we live in an age now, thank the Lord, where we have a different mindset towards different disabilities uh, and people are not sidelined in society. As a result, all efforts are made to encourage and help people with disabilities play as active a part as is humanly possible as much as anybody else. And for that, we thank the Lord and praise the Lord. That's true compassion, isn't it? That's true interest. That's true kindness. So that said, let's come to our verses before us this morning. Let's take a moment and pray and ask the Lord would help us with this thought, because in this passage, we see a specific prayer. You say, where do we see a specific prayer? Bartimaeus spoke to Jesus. Bartimaeus spoke to God the Son. Do you know what that's called when you speak to God? Prayer. He said, but he's, he's not here among us. Yes, he is. And we, we have access by grace and faith to the throne of grace. When we pray, friend, we are speaking to God, just as Bartimaeus was. The fact Bartimaeus may have been 12 feet from God makes absolutely no difference to God that he's in the third heaven today, friend. He hears your prayers. If you're a Christian, he hears your prayers in exactly the same way. What I'd ask you to think about this morning, does he hear from you about specific things? Or does he only hear you pray in generalisms? Because the Lord answers specific prayer, and we see the power of specific prayer here this morning. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, help us this morning. Lord, we need your help to recognize the power of specific prayer. That is specifically answered. Heavenly Father, I believe we live in such days and times where our faith is becoming weak. Lord, we're assailed by the things of the world, and as Christians, we, we almost find that our faith is assailed, and like the Father who needed help with his unbelief, Lord, help us with our unbelief. We don't want to pray specifically. We want to pray generally, Lord, because we're worried that you might not come through and we might seem foolish. Oh, Lord, strengthen us, strengthen our faith. Heavenly Father, uh, create in us a powerful praying people, a powerfully, specifically praying people. Our uh, many needs in our lives, in this world and in this church, and our Lord and our God, give us the faith and the power to name them specifically before your throne of grace and have the faith and patience to trust you in them. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.
Specific prayer, so, so important, friends. We live in days and times now where I believe many of us as Christians, are, are there many general things to pray about? Of course there are, and I'm not I'm not removing that necessity to pray in generally for, for other things, for generalisms, for general directions. But I do worry, I do fear that we live in the days and times where, you know, we do have some excesses within uh, Christian faith and denominations, but what that's done, it's almost taken Bible believers to, to reach the point of becoming very theological logical and very general and very religious about our prayers and, and we've taken to praying generally so you know you know if we might generally ask for this god if it may possibly be in your will and you possibly may deem to do this as a general thing however you may generally deem to do it then thank god now there's nothing wrong with that if you don't have a specific thing to pray but where has it gone friends when we read back of the prayers of old when we read back of the saints of old they were powerfully specific in their prayers where there's a specific need they specifically prayed and they specifically prayed until they got a specific answer and we'll look at that as we go through because that's the example we have before us here but one of the things i think is true because we live in such a cotton comforted cotton wool comforted marshmallow world where the state provides everything do we even always know our needs because that's the aim of satan you know even to make christians so comfortable and remove needs that christians don't get on their knees in powerful prayer heaven forbid they might even actually put some fast into that or spend some time in it because we are comfortable so what do we see first that we might learn from bartimaeus well firstly we see in the first few verses that he knew his need exactly Blind Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Bartimaeus had no difficulty knowing what his specific need was. A blind man in a world that didn't care for blind people, a blind man in a world that didn't give uh, uh, assistance to blind people, there were no government uh, uh, support, there was no government handouts, if you will, there was no government lift up and leg up, if you will, all Bartimaeus had uh, before him was a need, he knew he was blind and he knew that was not a good situation for him. We find that he was sat by the highway side begging. That was what his life was reduced to to meet his daily need. He could not work. He possibly was not even married. He was not involved within society to the greater degree. And we find that as life passed them by, they came to Jericho, he went out to Jericho with disciples and a great number of people. There's a multitude of able-bodied people, if you will, following along the Lord Jesus Christ, following along down the road, maybe great excitement, great encouragement. Everybody realizing things are, are going really, really well. No needs, no concerns, no cares. Why should we even care about some beggar on the side of the road? Everything's good for us. And they're quite happy to walk past and ignore blind Bartimaeus. Of course, in Matthew 20's account, we realize there were two blind men at the side of this is Mark's account, focusing on Bartimaeus himself. He knew his need exactly. He was reduced to sitting by the side of life. He was on the bylines of life, hoping that he could get a handout, hoping that he could get a morsel to provide for him. It was his only hope to sit by the side of the highway begging. Do you know what that is? That's the way the world prays. It sits on the side of life, not partaking in life, sticking its hand out and saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. It is sitting by the side of the world, putting your hand out to the world, hoping the world will provide. And why not? That's all the world can do. Shouldn't be so for us as Christians. We shouldn't be sat by the side of life with our hand out begging for any morsel that the world may give to us. You see, Bartimaeus had a decision to make. He knew his need exactly. Uh, and you and I as Christians have decisions to make. Do we want to hand out or do we want to hand up? There's a big difference between them. Now, Bartimaeus had no choice but to put his hand out. 
He knew specifically his need and he knew specifically what he needed. He could not change the fact that he was blind. And if it came down to the world, all he could do was keep putting his hand out in the hope that the world would give him something, that the world would help him. Friends, how many of us as Christians today have become very worldly in our approach? And we're sat by the side of the world. We don't want to impose on the world because we're Christians. You know, they don't like us too much. But we would still like it if they would help us along our way. And we sit there like beggars, not in the crowd, but we sit off to the side like beggars, putting our hand out, hoping the word world will give us something. We pray generally. We don't pray specifically. We pray generally because we're strong in the flesh. We have most of our needs taken care of, and those that aren't, if we just work a bit harder, we can get them taken care of. If we just, if we just you know, ask around a bit more, then we can find a way of getting it done. We're not, we're not sitting waiting for the Lord. We're not spending time with the Lord. We're, we're, even when we have a specific need that is known, we're looking in general. How can we get this fixed? And what, isn't that our go-to position now? I have this need. I have this ability. I need to try and fix it. I'll see what I can get done. And what I can't get done, I'll stick my hand out to the world, to the network of the people that I know, and see if they can meet my need. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it completely leaves God out of the whole thing. You see, that's the way that Bartimaeus had been conditioned. That's the only option that he had until the day that Christ passed by. Now, remember, this is the only opportunity, if you're familiar with the scriptures, that Bartimaeus had. Jesus Christ was not coming back after this. Jesus Christ was not going to pass Bartimaeus again. And Bartimaeus' life was going to change radically and significantly and miraculously because of the power of specific prayer. You know, we could ask the same question to us as Christians this morning, like Bartimaeus, are you satisfied sitting on the sidelines? Are you satisfied sticking your hand out for a handout from the world? Or are you prepared to look for a hand up by specific prayer to he who can arise us and lift us and give the very best of what we ask for? Are are, are we so fearful? Are we so frightened as Christians that we actually scurry into the sidelines? Are we hoping that the world won't notice us, the world won't abuse us, the world won't kick us? Maybe that's how Bartimaeus had begun. Maybe every time he, he put his hand out, he put it out reluctantly because rather than receive a morsel, maybe he received a jab. Maybe he received a jibe. You know, maybe said people said unkind things to him. Maybe they set their dogs over to him to lick his sores. Maybe, maybe he was just mocked and ridiculed and revolted. So he sat on the sidelines, just putting his hand out quietly. He sat on the edge of society, on the edge of the world, not trying to attract too much attention from the hoi polloi, but maybe just to get a hand out in passing. Aren't we becoming a little bit like that in Christians, as Christians? Aren't we just becoming a little bit quiet? Aren't we just sitting on the sidelines hoping that the world won't pay too much attention to us? And if we sit there quietly and if we sit there pathetically and if we sit there and acknowledge our disablement as Christians, oh, we know we're not like real people, but please just give us a pat on the head as you go past. Isn't that how we're becoming with our Christian life? We don't want to speak up. We don't want to stand up. We don't want to stand forth. We don't want to be in the crowd. We don't want to be a part of life. We don't want to be standing there and playing our part as Christians in this world. We just want to go over to the sidelines and put our hand out and hope that nobody's nasty to us and they put something good in our hand. Where's God? Where's God in that equation? We've left him out. Where's the power of specific prayer? We've left it out. Is it any wonder sometimes that we're not living powerful, power-filled, prayer-answered Christian lives because we've been conditioned to be like a kicked dog in the corner and we just don't want to be kicked anymore. So we quietly sit on the side and we put our hand out to the world and we thank them if they put a morsel in our hand. That's not the way to live the Christian life, friends. We need the power of specific prayer. Bartimaeus knew his need exactly. 
Now look at this in verse 47. Here's by the man blind, sat by the highway begging. But you know what? He knew that he didn't want to hand out. He knew that he wanted to hand up. Look at verse number 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. By the master said, it's now or never. You see, he got his provision from the world where he could, but he recognized that the real source of provision was in the Messiah, was in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't content to sit quietly anymore once Jesus was passing by. He wasn't content to be hushed. He didn't care if it meant uh, disparaging, insulting remarks. He didn't care if it meant opposition. He knew that his hope was in the Lord. Why? Because Christ is hope for the hopeless. Help for the helpless. You see, and he knew his need. Friends, as Christians, have we become a little bit hopeless and a little bit helpless because we stopped putting our faith and trust in the Lord? Because we get into the habit of using the world and the world's provision that we go up and down like a yo-yo depending upon how the world treats us. You see, Bartimaeus recognized his need, but he recognized the real source of provision. Have mercy on me. Why would he say that? Turn to Psalm 136, please, if you would. Psalm 136 this morning. We won't read the entirety of the psalm, but if if you're familiar with the psalm, you'll know the theme of it starts in verse 1 and continues all the way through. Psalm 136, verse number 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. And on the psalm goes for 26 verses, well, more than 26 verses, but 26 verses about God's mercy. And God's mercy is available to those who meet God's condition. And Bartimaeus knew he needed the mercy of the Lord, and he knew the one who could extend mercy to him was passing by, and he decided he didn't care what it meant about the world's provision. He didn't care what it meant about what the world thought about him. He didn't care about the ridicule and the rejection. He didn't care about the opposition. He knew there was only one to go to. He knew there was only one to speak to. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He went to the source. Look at verse number 48 of Mark chapter 10. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. So who's that? That's the crowd following Jesus. That's the religious crowd. You see, many followed Jesus who were religious. Some may not have been religious, but they just didn't want a delay on the route to Jerusalem. They didn't want Jesus to have to be bothered with a couple of disabled beggars on the side of the road. They didn't want delay. They they didn't want a a, a beggar in a scruffy beggar's cloak and a beggar's garment interrupting their fine parade into Jerusalem. They thought it would be detrimental to the show of religion that they wanted to put on as they were pushing forward the one they wanted to be king. They didn't want the common man, the beggarly man, the beggarly element. They didn't want him around Jesus. They they were pharisaical in their approach, even though they weren't Pharisees, because that was what they were used to. We got things cleaned up. We got this procession looking good, looking sharp, looking clean. We got Jesus being pushed forward as a king. We don't need that beggarly element attaching itself to us. We don't need to extend any mercy, compassion, or grace. Now, Jesus might. Now, he's a bit of a problem that way sometimes. You know, he he gets down with the rag tags of society. He spends time with the the beggarly element. Let's, 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 Let's shut them up because Jesus might hear them and we want to get into town with this clean parade and procession. We want this nice, clean church. We don't want the beggarly element. 
We don't want the common people. And many charged him, Barty Mayer, shut up. Stop shouting out. You're making a show of yourself. You can imagine some of them saying, oh, oh shut up, Barty Mayer. So, you know, and I'll slip you a chunk of bread here. Just be quiet and go away. Do we get like that in our Christian life? Do we get so used to it being cleaned up because we've come away from our beggarly element and we like a clean Christian life and we like a clean Christian church and we like clean things and everything to be neat and ordered and tidy and clean? That we do, you know, as James said, you've got a problem, I'll pray for you. You know, is that the same? Yeah, just shut up, we've got it on the prayer list. Now go away, we're praying for you. We don't want to actually get involved with you. We don't want to actually help you, but we'll pray for you. We've kind of ticked it off our list then, haven't we? Shut up. Don't bother Jesus. Don't come into church with that racket. Don't come into church with your kind of common man disablement. We'll pray for you. Here's some bread. Have a nice day. Doesn't James speak about that as our Christianity? Is that what it's become to? Do we become like the cleaned up Pharisees, the hypocritical Pharisees that we need to protect what we've got because we think it's so good and we don't want our life messed up? We don't want to help the helpless. We don't want to love the unlovable because it's messy. It is messy. Many charge him that he should hold his peace. What does it say? But he cried the more a great deal. You see, he prays, the son of David, have mercy on me. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Hold your noise. Now, Bartimaeus could have responded to that. Oh, I'm getting a bit emotional in my prayer. I'm getting a bit loud. I'm getting a bit noisy in my prayer. And he could have shut up, couldn't he? Oh, yes, I'm not really following the religious theological pattern here, am I? Yes, I'd better be quiet. Those good, godly men following Jesus, sharply educated, looking the part. I mean, they've been to theological college. They said, shut up. Oh, my prayer must have been too emotional when I, when I cried, you know, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I probably didn't follow the right format in the prayer. Maybe I didn't start it right. Maybe I didn't use the right words. Maybe I didn't end it right. Probably was a little bit of emotion tapped in there because I don't want to be blind anymore. Forgive me. I'll scurry back off to the corner and make sure I follow the religious norms. No. He cried the more a great deal. Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you know what we find? The lack of eloquence and the lack of education were no barrier to the common man reaching Jesus. What a shame it is that we live in such days and times where you'd be forgiven if you go for many churches, particularly of a certain type and stripe, that you need a master's in theology to understand the prayer. It's that eloquent. It's that theological. You have no idea what they're saying, but you just realize, man, I couldn't pray like that. You're not only is it theological, it's in full King James English, and they've got all the thouest, knowest, and shouldest in the right order, and this lifting of oratory, eloquence is lifted forward, and you're like poor blind Bartimaeus in the, in the corner. Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. Oh, and they say, stop being emotional in that prayer. Oh, thou the artist, highest of the most disciplines. Wouldn't you be forgiven sometimes when you're in some churches to think, oh, man, I'm just a blind beggar. I've got to get a dictionary just to understand the words of their prayer. Would you turn with me to, oh, well, just cut the pages over to Mark 12 and verse 37. Now, it's, it's the Lord speaking. Well, let's give context. Let's go from verse 35. Just the fact that it's Jesus answering the question. And, and Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies a footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? Jesus answers a question. But it's the statement after that that gets you. The verse 37 ends, and the common people heard him gladly. But you know what we find? 
Not only did the common people hear the Lord gladly, because he wasn't trying to impress the crowds with his theological degrees and doctorates. He wasn't trying to impress the crowds with his knowledge of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. He didn't use words like harmartiology instead of just saying sin. He just said it for what it was because the common people heard him gladly. But you know what we find out from Bartimaeus? Not only did the common people hear Jesus gladly, Jesus heard the common man gladly. What a shame it is when our religion as Christians has got to such that people in a prayer meeting, people in some churches feel cowed and bowed not to pray and to keep their mouth shut because they think, I don't have the terms and I've no idea what anybody's talking about. Friend, prayer is speaking to God. Speak as you are. Speak as you speak. Speak to your Father in heaven. And friend, recognize the source of all that provision as well. You must say, I've got a lack of eloquence in my prayer. God wants to hear from you. I've got a lack of education in my prayer. God wants to hear from you. God doesn't appoint prayer spokespeople to pray for everyone. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, God wants to hear from you. He doesn't care about your regional accent or your dialect. He doesn't care whether you speak to him in King James English or not. He speaks to us in King James English. We speak to him however we speak. He doesn't take a checklist. Let me see how many O levels, A levels, how many degrees this person has got before I decide whether their prayer is intelligent enough to be worthy of my time. He began to cry out in verse 47, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. They told him to be quiet. Shut your mouth, Bartimaeus. You're just a common beggar, a scruff, a ragtag. What right do you have to think that you can speak to Jesus? Do you know what he did? He didn't correct his prayer. He didn't alter his prayer. He didn't go away and study what he should have said. He put more emotion, more power, and more depth, but he cried the more. A great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. I don't know what was wrong with the first prayer, Lord. I don't know why these religious people are telling me to shut up and not to pray. But all I know how to do is I'm coming again with the same prayer. I'm coming again with the same request. I'm putting more emotion, more power, and I'm directing it straight to you, Jesus. Doesn't it make you wonder if we've lost the touch? of the common man, the common man that hears Jesus gladly and the common man that Jesus hears gladly. I wonder if we've got such powerless Christian lives in this land because we've surrendered the ground of prayer to the educated, eloquent elite. And I wonder if Christians covertly, overtly, consciously or subconsciously get newly saved or are fairly newly saved, and they don't feel they can even join within the prayer. They feel like it's holy ground, and they don't even know how to take their shoes off to get onto the holy ground. And all prayer is is a child of God speaking to their Father in heaven as they would speak. And throwing that emotion, that pleading, and that need, throwing it in there, knowing exactly to whom you pray, knowing exactly for what you pray. The only obstacle to Bartimaeus' prayer was the religious people. And you know what? Even they couldn't stop the power of his specific prayer. Verse 49 of Mark chapter 10, look at this. And Jesus stood still. Isn't that incredible? The blind beggar lifted up his voice, overwhelmed the obstacle, and Jesus stood still. He got the attention of the Lord. Friend, do you want to be a victim or a victor in your prayer life? Do you want victorious prayer? Jesus stood still. That's the Bible saying, Bartimaeus got the Lord's attention. Against the crowd, against the obstacles, Bartimaeus cried out the more, and Jesus stood 
still. That means he heard Bartimaeus and he wanted to listen to Bartimaeus and he wasn't going to be shuffled along by the religious crowd. I know Jesus, don't you bother with this. Don't worry. We'll sort out Bartimaeus. We'll give him a loaf of bread. We'll shut him up so he doesn't bother you. Jesus stood still because of the cry, the emotional cry, the repetitive cry of Bartimaeus because it wasn't vain repetition. It was a specific need directed to a specific saviour. And Jesus stood still. Friend, do you want to be victorious in your prayer or do you want to be a victim in your prayer? The choice is yours. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. Now, that are not, those are not only wonderful words. Isn't that a wonderful order? Who did Christ call? The one who called upon him. Do you see that? Jesus didn't call Bartimaeus and he followed. Bartimaeus called upon the Lord and the Lord called him. That should shed some light. Go to Romans 8. I don't want to go into any deep theology. This is a simple message here this morning, but you have to go into deep theology to confuse the simple truth of the word of God sometimes. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, who did Christ foreknow? It means he knew ahead of time who would know him. Now, it doesn't say anything about Jesus Christ marking out or God marking out before someone is even born that I know you and I'm going to send you to earth and when you get to earth, you're going to be one of my elect because I've already marked you out to be one of my elect. Whom he did foreknow, who does he foreknow? All of those that would call upon the name of the Lord because God sees ahead of time. So that's simple. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be saved? No. To be conformed to the image of his son. So those who Christ knew ahead of, those who God knew ahead of time would believe on the Lord. God put a predestination package up to say those who do believe, there's already a package ahead to sanctify you. Once you're saved. That's the predestination, that you'll be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate to what? Sanctification. We just read it in the verse before. Though he did predestinate, them he also called. Who did Jesus call? Those who he foreknew would be saved, who he predestinated to be sanctified. He then called those who called upon him to be sanctified. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Not one word in those verses says that God marked some people out before time to be saved. A predestined elect, it doesn't say that unless you try and make it mean that, but that's not what it says. When do you become elect? When you've called upon the name of the Lord. You become one of the elect after you get saved. So what's that? That's the common understanding, the common truth of the common words without complicating the Bible to match your theology, but basing your theology on the Bible. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? When you're the Lord's, you're the Lord's. You say, what's that? The Lord called Bartimaeus after Bartimaeus had called upon the Lord. That's just the simple truth. Romans 10, what well, were there? Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, see the order? That's somebody calling on the Lord. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised it from the dead. So that's a genuine calling. It's not just with the mouth, it's with the heart. Thou shalt be what? Saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Drop down to verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, you get saved and then God calls you. You call upon the Lord and he calls you. Say, can I come to you? And he says, come here. It's that simple. And when you come, he says, by the way, I've got a predestination package for you. So what's that? 
I heard somebody say the predestination was the salvation. And God says, I don't believe that nonsense. Just read the Bible. The predestination package is this. You're now adopted. You're already elect. And I've got a predestined package for you. As one of my elect, because you called upon me and I called you, I called you to give you a package. Here's the package. Here is your predestined adoption as a son. Here is your predestined confirmation, conformation to the image of Jesus Christ. Here is your predestined adoption and sanctification package. Nowhere does it say there's a predestined salvation package unless you get so intelligent that you've changed the word of God to suit your theology and that theology is unbiblical and it's nonsense. So what's the common man, the beggar? He called upon the Lord and the Lord called him. He said, Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, I will come to me. You called upon me. I'm calling you. Come to me. It's that simple. What's that? Beautiful picture of salvation. You believe who I am, you call upon me, then I'll call you to me, and I'll be with you, and you'll be with me. See, that's a picture of salvation, but let's not get away uh, to that. We've preached that before. Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. What a picture of salvation. You see here in verse 50, and he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. He cast off that beggarly garment. He came to the Lord. Just go to John, John uh, chapter 5, verse 39. Well, verse 39 and 40, John 5. You see, the Lord spoke with religious people, hypocritical people, pharisaical people. And this is what he said in John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think, you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. What's Jesus saying? He says, you search the scriptures and you've invented your own theology and you know that the Messiah is in there and you think you've interpreted it right. And you will not come to me that you might have life. So it's quite simple. If you call on the Lord, he'll call to you. If you go to Christ, he'll come to you. That's the salvation. You must believe by grace through faith. And Jesus says, come in. Come here. I'll come to you. He doesn't say, come in, and you can't resist this call, and I'm dragging you in, kicking and screaming. There's another thing you can do about it because I've called you. And by the way, you will now give you just a little spark, and you go, oh, I've been redeemed. No, sorry, I've been regenerated. And I've got another spot. Now I need to be redeemed because the Lord called me. That's not what the scripture said. Jesus says, you call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. You call me and I'm coming to you. That's what Jesus said. Don't get that thing messed up, friends, because otherwise you'll be like the religious crowd following Jesus. You'll say, shut up, beggar. Quiet down your noise. Jesus hasn't called you. And until he calls you, you stay on the sidelines. If you're not one of his called, you're not coming in. That's not what the Bible says. Some theologians say that, but of course they're just incapable of straight reading the Bible. Was saved by grace through faith, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you're saved because when you call upon the name of the Lord, he says, I've heard you, come to me, I'm in you, you're in me. Then it all takes place. But what are we looking at this morning? Specific prayer. Let's not get sidetracked. All right. Uh, Bartimaeus, he knew his need exactly. He knew his need specifically. So did the Lord. But he says to him in verse number 51, and Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt that I should do unto thee? Why have you called me, Bartimaeus? Why are you praying? What did Bartimaeus say? Well, generally, Lord, if you could have general mercy upon me and whatever you deem to put forward in my life to make it good, bad, or indifferent, I wouldn't dare to impose any theological concepts or constructs upon you. I wouldn't dare to come to you with emotion. I wouldn't dare to come to you with the specifics. But if you could generally pull your common grace and somehow over and upon me, as that generally comes out to me, I'll be thankful and thank you generally that you generally did something, even though I don't know what it was. Is that how he prayed? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Why, Bartimaeus, what do you want? I'm blind and I want to see. So what's that specific prayer? You know, sometimes 
Maybe you're going to the Lord in prayer and you're asking generally for something that God has shown you specifically. Have you analyzed and recognized your need? Now, it's okay to pray generally when you don't know what the need is, but when you know what the need is, have you been so bad by theological nonsense that tells you not to put any emotion into your prayer, not to put any specifics into your prayer? Don't be so bold as to tell God exactly what you need. Don't you be so bold as to tell God what you want. Well, in the Bible, when somebody knows what they want, when Peter's drowning, he didn't say, oh, Lord, if you could possibly deem to put some common grace in my general direction that may or may not involve me not drowning and going straight to heaven. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that to you. It's your goodwill, whatever your goodwill is in this situation, glug, 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 whatever is your goodwill as I drown. And God's just going, say the words, Peter, save me. Specific prayer. You know what Jesus did? He saved him. Bartimaeus, what do you want? I'm blind and I want to see. Thank you, Bartimaeus. That's pretty specific. Now, it doesn't mean God's going to answer it in the way you want him to answer it, right? But it's specific prayer. He prayed with a specific need. He prayed emotionally. He didn't pray eloquently. He didn't pray educatedly. He just prayed specifically in the only way he knew how, specifically and emotionally. He cried out and he cried the more to the one who could answer his specific prayer, that I might receive my sight. So what was that? His desire. Do you think Bartimaeus didn't desire to see? Sometimes don't those of us who maybe don't have a disablement of any description, don't you forget sometimes or assume that everybody's, well, they're just a happy person. They must be content with their lot. They must be content with being deaf or blind or whatever it is. Maybe they're not. Maybe they managed to walk in contentment with it, but... Maybe they would change it in a heartbeat. You say, what's that? It's specifically knowing your need and specifically asking that of the Lord. Go to Psalm 37 and verse number four. You see, we see that he knew his need exactly and he asked the Lord specifically, secondly. He asked the Lord specifically. Psalm 37. And he asked him specifically because he had the desire to see. Psalm number 37 and verse number four. Well, let's read verse number three. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. But look at verse number four. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He was delighted that Christ was coming back. You know, maybe he'd heard as the bypassers went by, we don't know why, but he was delighted that Christ was coming past. He was showing that delight in Christ and who he was. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. He asked the Lord specifically, and his desire was to be heard and healed. Do you know what that used to be called and probably still is today? Praying through. You know, we live in a busy world and we've got busy lives today. Do you take the time to pray through anymore? You say, I don't, I don't even know what that is. Well, if you've read anything of Christians of days have gone by, it was a common thing. And that's a bit like Jacob wrestling with God until he gets the blessing. That's praying through. Praying to the resolution. That's setting the time aside with a specific prayer that you are going to go to the Lord and until God gives you an assurance that that specific prayer has been answered, you don't get up from that time of prayer. And you pray and you pray and you pray until God gives you peace. I was reminded of it again even just last week. Uh, I was fortunate Lewin lent me the uh, biography of his grandfather. Remember we talked about Dudley Dalton? I know I'm not the first to have read that. Uh, and great work that was done out there in Tanzania when it was Tanganyika and all the rest of it. But one of the areas in that, you know, because he was so dependent upon the Lord when he was out there uh, uh, and to go out there. And one of the times he and his brother, they were praying for hours on a particular issue and they did not get up from that prayer until the Lord gave them peace that it was answered. He didn't give him the answer, 
But they had a peace that God had the answer. And they got up and they carried on in that faith and God did provide the answer. So what's that? That's praying through. You see, he cried unto Jesus. That's praying. That's your 10 minutes before bed or your 15 minutes at lunchtime or your five seconds before you get out of bed in the morning. Dear Lord, let me have a good day. Whatever you might pray. But he cried the more a great deal. And Jesus stood still. Do you know what that means? He prayed through. He knew God had heard him. And God said, what do you want? And then he asked specifically, I want my sight. I wonder how many of you prayed like that recently. I wonder how many of you are so affected by theological nonsense that your prayer is just a general mishmash of something or anything that you hope the Lord might do in his goodwill as he pleases. But you've got a specific need. And you've got a particular saviour and he wants to hear you pray through. He wants to hear you pray specifically and emotionally and he wants to hear you cry the more because he's given you his ear and he wants to hear exactly what it is that you want. He wants you to know that you've heard him and he wants you to have a peace. You say, what's that? That's the power of specific prayer. Lord, that I might perceive my sight. Do you know, I, I'm sure I might be preaching to the choir, but, you, you know, I found this in, in my Christian life. And some of the things I pray specifically about, as far as I know, I don't think I've had an answer on them. I certainly haven't had the answer that I want. But God equally so in between all of those things, you know, even just a fairly recent times, I found myself praying very specifically, you know, finances can get a little bit tight. At times, as we go on in faith with the Lord, I'm thankful that Dawn works part time, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, it has us up and down. Some people support us, some people send money through to us, and sometimes that doesn't come. You know, I found the Lord praying, I found myself praying before the Lord on that specific matter. One but a week after, I had a peace, I know it's with you, Lord, you bring the answer, and that's what it is. I had a phone call a week later. I won't give you all the details from a friend of mine in another country. And we were just chit chatting back and forth. I haven't heard from him for a while from a church in another country. He says, the reason, the reason I, I want to speak to you, he said, he said, we've been collecting some support for you and Dawn for a couple of years now. He said, how am I going to get it to you? Now, that's no small sum of money. It's not like a tiny 25 pound. It's a couple of years worth of people giving and praying for us. We didn't know they were giving. We sent them prayer letters. We said, no, I just, you know, I want to get this to you. So what's that? That was God's specific answer. What do, you, what, what do you want? And I asked him for what I want, and I got a specific answer. Now, that's just one, one account. Please don't think so. Was like, man, I'm just saying that's, that's literally happened within the last couple of weeks. But let's bring this to a general level. What's our vision? One for 21. One saved, one fed, you know, one discipled, one added to the church. How many of you are praying for that generally? Oh, Lord, you know our church vision this year. We want to see one saved, one discipled, one added to the church. Say, so what's that? That's general, isn't it? What is the vision? It's personal. Every one of us wants to lead one person to Christ this year to disciple them ourselves and see them added to the church. You say, what? That? Now, that's specific. So how does your prayer go for 1 for 21? Does it sound something like this? Oh, Lord, you know our church vision for this year is 1 for 21, and we want to see people saved and added to the church. Is that specific? No. Or does your prayer go something like the church vision is this, and, Lord, I'm a part of that. And, God, I ask that you would lead me to a person today who's seeking you, who's seeking answers, who doesn't know the truth, that you would bring me to somebody today that I might share the gospel with them today, that they may be saved today. Not only saved, they have a desire to know the truth, and I can disciple them, I can bring them to church, and they'll be saved, baptized, discipled, and added to the church. Lord, will you help me to do that today? You see the difference? How many of you are praying like that? How many of you are oh, I just, I just wish the Lord would give me opportunity to save someone. Have you asked them to? I mean specifically. 
Have you asked him to lead you to someone today to be a recipient of the gospel and be saved? However you want to phrase that, but it's personal. That's the power of personal prayer. You see, general prayer is good, but and oftentimes it's needed, but when we have specific things and you have specific things, do you know the power of specific prayer? He knew his need exactly. He asked the Lord specifically. He received help directly. Look at verse 52. And Jesus said to him, unto him, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. He didn't say, go away. I'll see what is the general will of me and the Father and what is the general common grace that we might decide that we might want to extend to you in a very general way that you might very genuine, generally accept that we're generally answering prayers. Lord, have mercy on me. What do you want? I want to see. Okay. Here's the answer. Here's the answer to you, Bartimaeus. Here's the provision for you, Bartimaeus, because you asked me for what you needed. He received help directly. Now let me ask you something. If you're praying through something at the moment, are you praying specifically? Are you praying repeatedly, investing your emotion and your very fiber of your being cried out the more? Are you making a specific request? So I'm, I'm doing those things. Are you praying through? Have you spent hours? So I'm doing that. Have you fasted? Heaven forbid we should have some Christians who could go a day or so without food anymore. I don't mean just for health benefits, I mean just to pray. So I can't get an answer. Have you prayed through? Well, no, try that. Can't get an answer. Have you prayed specifically? Yes. Have you prayed through? Yes. Is it important? Yes. Have you fasted? Well, it's not that important, then, is it? Thy faith hath made thee whole. Do you have the faith to pray specifically? Do you have the faith to pray through? Do you have the faith to put some fasting on top of that? To really get close with the Lord in this specific matter that you had? Thy faith hath made thee whole. He received help directly. And look at this lastly and very briefly this morning. He followed Christ faithfully. In the verse 52, and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Do you know sometimes it's a self-destructive circle for some Christians? They don't recognize their need exactly. They don't pray specifically. They don't receive directly. So they stop following him faithfully. You started the problem, but you conclude the problem is the Lord, and then you stop following him because you didn't get the answer that you wanted, but you actually didn't start the pattern in the first place. You live a general Christian life that's generally Christianly acceptable, that generally follows Jesus, that generally prays, that generally receives some answers, but when it comes down to the specifics, we don't get invested in the specific prayer with the Lord. We don't have the power of heaven on our individual lives because we miss the power of specific individual prayer. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. And it's a good job he did because Jesus didn't come back after that. Christ went to the cross. That was his one chance. Friends, if you don't, Pray specifically, it might be your one chance. It might be your one opportunity. It might be the one thing you have left out out of everything else that you've done so well, but the thing that was needed you didn't do, and therefore you did not. So imagine if Bartimaeus had sat silent on the side. I don't want to cause any offense. I don't want people to tell me I shouldn't ask God specifically. 
I don't want to invest any emotion into that prayer because, you know, I'm very theological and you know how that emotionalism is. That's that's the ground of the charismatics. I don't want to go there. I'm too theological to put an emotion in that prayer. And I wouldn't dare to have the affront and the lack of humility to ask God for a specific need. Okay. That's your, that's your position. It's just not biblical. I'm not knocking you if that's your position. If you're getting by, that's great. But I know there's people in here, in this room today, with specific needs, specific prayers. And all I hope, and I truly hope this morning, through God's word and the power of God's Holy Spirit, that maybe he's just given you a key this morning that you'd missed. Maybe there's just a section of your life that you've missed, and you've missed what Bartimaeus did not miss. You've missed that the time is now. You've missed that Christ wants to hear from you and he wants to hear about your need exactly and he wants you to ask for what you need specifically and he wants you to pray for it and he wants you to pray through it and he wants you to invest in that prayer and he wants to answer it directly because every good and perfect gift comes from the Father with whom there's no variableness. Because he wants you to keep following him faithfully. Now, let me just put this last caveat as we close. You can only pray specifically, can't you, for things that you know that are in the will of God. Oh, God, give me a Ferrari. That's a specific prayer, right? Oh, God, make me a millionaire. But you couldn't pray fully invested in that, knowing it's to be true. You say, well, Paz, you know, you just mentioned about that we should pray specifically that, that, that God should lead each of us to one, one to bring. The, how do you know that's God's will? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to Peter 39. He says you can pray specifically knowing that that prayer is in the will of God. Some things you may not know, but you know it's a specific need, not a desire. You know, Bartimaeus didn't have to have sight, but he desired it and he needed it. And the Lord granted it. But he couldn't have known whether it was God's will to perform that miracle. But it was a specific need. And he believed that it was something that Christ wanted to have compassion upon and demonstrate the goodness and kindness of God. So all I'll say to you this morning is, friends, may the Lord help us, every one of us, to learn the power of praying emotionally and specifically and repeatedly crying out to our God that we may know the power individually, the power of specifically answered prayer because that will sustain us in a great way and we can keep following the Lord. May God help us not to sit by the wayside silent beggars hoping the world will throw us a crumb when we have the source of all power and provision and he just wants to hear from you and God help us Father we come before you this morning and Lord help us to be as the saints of all Lord we've got too smart we've got too puffed up we're too full of theology and nonsense that we've forgotten that the common man heard Jesus gladly and we forgot never more that Jesus hears the common man gladly. Heavenly Father, help us not to desire eloquence and education. Neither of those are bad things, Lord. You know that, and I pray that's not the impression that I've given. But, Lord, when we feel and think that we ourselves are an obstacle to ourselves in prayer, because we don't know the right phraseology and theology to come before your throne of grace. And Heavenly Father, that's a sad state of affairs. Help your people to cry out to you, and the more we're mocked or ridiculed or reviled or theologically corrected, help us to cry out the more, to plead with you specifically and earnestly, that we may receive help and answer directly and that we will continue to follow you faithfully, 
May we learn this great truth from Brother Mayus this morning and apply it to our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.